and reggae as a song that I love to hear. Jamaica is not cool. It is hot and sticky. Nobody runs anywhere unless pursued by armed police. When used as a greeting, the phrase cool runnings is stated more in hope than as a reflection of reality. For keeping cool is crucial, but it is hard work, and having to work hard is definitely uncool. But that is what you have to do as a teacher in Jamaica, usually in a muck sweat and with limbs itching and swollen from the onslaughts of millions of mosquitoes. My friends and colleagues in England, marking exercise books in centrally heated gloom, were, I have no doubt, envious of my glamorous tropical situation and pictured me sipping a rum punch under some palm tree by a beach. I did achieve that blissful state once or twice during the holidays, but they were a long way off, and to begin with, I had to work out how to get to school. A minibus, so I was told, would take me from Mona Heights, where I was living, to Kingston College on North Street. That all sounded innocuous enough, so I waited at the bus stop on the aptly named Old Hope Road at 6.30 in the morning. A van came screaming to a halt with a man leaning out of it yelling halfway tree and at the top of his voice. His was not the only body leaning out of the van. Bottoms, knees, elbows, heads all stuck out of the vehicle at all sorts of angles. There was clearly no room inside and I opted to wait for the next one to come along. However, I was immediately and with some firmness led to the van door while the conductor, part of whose job was to pack bodies into the van, ordered children to move out of the way for the white man. A small space was found for me, so I squeezed in. The van roared off and I was covered with bodies. Everybody apologised and laughed. We were on our way downtown. sweatier and more dangerous than uptown. Kingston College was a split-site school located in its very heart. Because of the demands of the timetable, I had to undertake a 20-minute walk between the two sites at about 11 o'clock in the morning every day. The sun beat down on my balding crown. I bought a large straw hat in self-defence, dressed in whites and with my new hat. I thought I looked rather dashing until an elderly gentleman passing by just stopped and stared. He then passed on with a rueful smile. I discovered later that the hat I was wearing was known as a busher hat and was the type favoured by the overseers on the old colonial sugar plantations. My efforts to keep cool had touched on the history of oppression and violence in Jamaica. The British had created in the Caribbean a society based on greed, violence and racism. And although the slave system had been formally abolished in 1838, the legacy of that system still bubbled ominously under the surface. You could see it 
in the way that young women who worked as housemaids or helpers, as they were euphemistically called, were treated by their employers. You could see it in the treatment of thieves or suspected thieves by those who caught them thieving. You could see it in the continued dislocation of men from family life and in their attitude to women. You could see it in the colour-coded class system that continued to dominate society. All these were direct hangovers from the society that the British established in the 300 years before independence. Since then, two new forces had arrived to replace the old power. Capitalism from the USA and communism from Cuba. These new powers had inflamed the old sores of violence and repression and brought them rushing back to the surface. On my daily walk between sites, I spotted a notice pinned to a lamppost which stated, By this order there shall be no rape, no theft, no murder, no wrongful treatment of women, children or the old people. These offences shall be punishable by death. Signed, The North Street Posse. Kingston College was in an area where the authority of the police had been replaced by that of a posse. A group of men, funded by the drug trade and a political party. In 1979, only three years before my arrival, some 800 people had been shot dead in Kingston as a result of the struggle for power between the communist-backed JLP and the capitalist JNP. The war between the two factions identifying colours in downtown Kingston was still in progress. As a foreigner, I was not at first aware that I was in the middle of what was effectively a war zone, until it was pointed out to me. After school, I would walk along North Street to Church Street, clutching my saxophone, so that I could rehearse with George, the leader of the band I'd joined, at the back of his shop. The walk took about 20 minutes. One time, as I arrived, George told me that he already knew that I was on my way. How did you know? I inquired. He pointed to the roof of a building. There was a man holding a machine gun. He explained that there were men with guns all the way along North Street observing every passerby. One of them had relayed the news to him that I had left the school gates and should be arriving in about 20 minutes. Would they shoot me? I asked. No, man. Only if you are wearing orange over here or green over there, he said, pointing to the streets to the west of us. In any case, them don't bother white people especially foreigners. Why not? You're not part of the problem. My students, on the other hand, were part of the problem insofar as they belonged to families who were either JNP or JLP, and they all lived downtown or close by. They were trying to get educated in a very violent environment. The school itself wasn't violent, apart from the usual beatings for misdemeanours, on the whole, the boys behaved with great respect to each other and to the staff. Perhaps they were only too aware of what real violence, the kind they encountered on a daily basis outside the school gates, could mean. On one particular day, it all seemed to pour in as if someone had opened the floodgates. It was lunchtime and I was sitting and talking to Errol, a friend and colleague. The boys were, as usual, strolling around the schoolyard, eating their sandwiches and talking when without any warning an army lorry burst in through the school gates. It screeched to a halt, throwing up a cloud of dust. Out of the back poured a gang of soldiers in fatigues. They were armed with machine guns. The soldiers raced around the playground, holding boys up against the wall and frisking them. Other boys were made to empty their pockets at gunpoint. Finally, after they had accosted all the boys they could find, they climbed back into the lorry and, with machine guns pointing out of the rear of the vehicle, drove back onto the street and away. What was that about? I asked Errol. 
Somebody steal a watch or something, he explained. Does that need the army? Errol shrugged and said. They must show their presence once in a while. It's the beginning of the school year, so they feel they must demonstrate their authority while they can. I don't think there'll be any further trouble. From whom? The boys or the soldiers? Either. There goes the bell. I have a class to teach. Take it easy now. As far as the boys were concerned, the real violence came not from the army flexing its muscles in school, but from the thieves who lay in wait outside the school gates, ready to lift items from every youth who looked like they might have anything to take. All the boys were advised not to wear watches or carry money as they would be easy targets. One little boy in my tutor group forgot this advice and was duly held up on his way to school in the morning. He was robbed at knife point by six men who relieved him of his watch. To complete his misery, they snipped his school tie in half. Kingston College was a grammar school of some prestige and the tie was a symbol either to be respected or vilified according to your point of view. I felt sorry for the boy, who was clearly shocked and very tearful. He was only 11 years old, so I tried to restore his shattered morale with a few words of sympathy. The following day, when I saw him in class, I noticed that he had a series of dark welts along his left arm. How did that happen? I asked. My father beat me with a strap. Why? Because I carried a watch to school. My daddy had told me not to. As it turned out, his father was a policeman. Maybe he couldn't find the criminals, but at least he could try to ensure that his boy wouldn't present an easy target for them. In general, the boys were very obedient. Punishment for indiscipline was immediate, and questions were usually asked after it had been administered. When boys forgot themselves and quarrels turned into fights, the deputy head, Father Ramsey, would whip all those involved on the spot without asking any questions at all. In fact, the first indication that a fight was over came when Father Ramsey's blows made themselves felt. Then the combatants would break away, stand bolt upright, and receive a dozen more blows to the back or legs. I once met the father at the end of a school day, looking a little worn. Had a hard day, father, I inquired. My arm is a little sore, he said, rubbing his whipping arm. Disciplining these boys is hard work, you know. All the boys knew that expulsion from the school meant that they would probably get no further education of any kind for secondary school places were in very short supply. At that time, towards the end of 1982, only two out of Jamaica's 11 parishes were able to insist on compulsory education at primary level. Jamaican students knew that they were lucky to get any secondary schooling at all, especially at a prestigious establishment such as Kingston College. It was a school, like most schools in Jamaica, that allowed no dreadlocks and no other forms of what the head would have described as deviant behaviour. To be expelled from such a school would have meant that they would have had their hopes of a respectable job and a comfortable lifestyle shattered. All they could look forward to then would be a life not dissimilar to that lived by the men they feared namely the robbers and beggars who hung about outside the school gates. Consequently, discipline in class was never really a problem. It was, in fact, a pleasure to teach such enthusiastic pupils, even if I knew that some of the obedience and enthusiasm came from harsh necessity, rather than from a pure love of learning. After lessons were over, I would often sit and talk with some of the boys on a bench under a flame tree in the schoolyard. Many of them had relations in Britain, uncles, aunts, sometimes fathers and mothers who'd gone there to earn a living. They knew about London, Ipswich, Leeds and Liverpool. Most of them were mad about football and watched Match of the Day on television on Sunday afternoon. 
They were very impressed when I told them that I lived within earshot of the roar of the Arsenal crowd. Had I met the players? Who was going to win the cup? Not being much of a football fan, I sometimes found it hard to supply the answers. I was even less equipped to contribute to their other principal topic, violence. Living in downtown Kingston, they heard gunshots on a regular basis. Their friends, relations and colleagues had been shot or held up and robbed by the gunman. Sometimes in these one-sided conversations, I would realise that I was listening to the traumatised victims of a civil war, just as you might in Belfast, Kosovo or Israel. In spite of this, the boys took me into their confidence and were able to speak to me without any of the prejudices that I had already come across amongst the teachers. I found them to be one of the most interesting and perceptive groups of people I have yet encountered. Perhaps because of the rawness of life around them, they were philosophical in the true sense of the word, in that they were looking for answers to the big questions of life. They may also have been aware that the future of the island probably lay in their hands, as they, after all, were the lucky ones who were at least able to get the type of education which could place them in positions of power and authority in their country. Some, of course, were looking for a way out of the mess. The universities of the USA offered the best escape route by means of scholarships, principally for students who excelled in basketball or athletics. Consequently, the annual Interschools Athletics Championship was a big occasion. The national press wrote glowing accounts of the prowess of the track and field heroes. The stands were packed. There were the boys who were not performing. There were parents and relatives. There were hundreds of Kingstonians who identified in some way or other with one of the competing schools. There were also thousands of adoring girls, anxious to benefit by association with a young man who might be able to hold out a future that promised wealth and security and possibly fame. Marriage was the goal. But even to bear such a person's child was at least to have a link with money and success. So after the field day, there was the party. A few of the winners did get scholarships. A few of the girls did get married to them. In any event, Jamaica's infant population inevitably expanded. Oh,